Hey, welcome to our show. I'm Ken Lawson. Our guest today is going to be public defender Peter Wolf and first, the public, first assistant public defender Ali Silver. We're going to talk about the Kealoha case. And when I was asked to come and host this show on Friday, and they said, bring any guest that you want, right? You two guys came, came to mind first. And I tell you why, we just seen one of the biggest corruption trials come to a conclusion last week with, with uh, Louis and Catherine K. Aloha being found guilty of conspiracy to violate Gerard Poana's civil rights and obstructing justice. And the guess, I guess being a co-director of the Hawaii Innocence Project, we get so many applications from clients who said, my lawyer didn't listen to me. I told my lawyer that I was actually innocent and he didn't believe me. Uh, and I mean, and you've seen through DNA exonerations, since 1993, 350 uh, exonerations through DNA testing showing that people are actually innocent. The uh, Netflix series with, with uh, 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 the Central Park Five showing how this happens. And what impressed me about this case is that, that, that your office, Peter and, and Allie, um, took Gerard's case and, and listened to him, you know? I mean, here you got, I'm about to turn it over to you guys because I want you to do all the talk and I just want to listen. It's just so fascinating. But here you have a client. You know, I did criminal uh, defense work for almost 20 years, right? So you get client, you know, after about 10 years, right, you hear it all. So you get this man coming in your office and he says, look, you know, they're saying I stole this mailbox. Who is they? Well, the chief of police and his high-ranking prosecutor wife, right? And I didn't do it, right? And, and so I guess my question to... to how did, how did this unravel? Because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be talking about this case today. And that's the honest of God truth. Peter? Well, I, I mean, the way our office works has been set up is Ali assigns the cases when they come in and so that they're fairly distributed. And he assigned this case to himself. But I don't think he assigned this case to himself because he thought it would develop into what it developed into. I mean, he assigned it to himself because he assumed that the government had a good case. And he was concerned that a theft of a mailbox shouldn't result in a lengthy prison sentence just because it was the chief's mailbox when nobody could remember a single similar prosecution in the District of Hawaii in 20 or 30 years. But it turned out through Allie's work and really also through the work of our investigative staff that there was a lot more to this case than met the eye. Yeah, yeah. Allie? Yeah, when the case came in, all we really knew was that a mailbox had been stolen. It belonged to the chief of police and the pro, you know one of the highest state prosecutors in the land here, and that there was a video, and that they simply were identifying the person on the video who they knew, which was their uncle. So when you take those facts, you're thinking, well, this is a slam dunk. <laughs> you know, the only issue that yeah. I was concerned about is what Peter said, which is, you know, I don't want someone like this to get slammed at sentencing because of who these people were. So when we initially, that was kind of the structure of the case and how we were viewing the case. And then of course, Mr. Poana came in and normally my process with any defendant is, I don't talk about the case when they first come in. I talk about the process of federal court, the, you know, the indictment and what discovery we're gonna get and how you do a trial and what the guidelines are so that we kind of get to know each other while we talk about the legal process. And then I ask a client to come back and talk about what happened. Well, Mr. Puana, you know, wouldn't let me get through the process. He just kept insisting he was being framed and it wasn't him. And there was this lawsuit that he was filing against, you know, Catherine Kealoa and it was all a setup. And so it was somewhat antagonistic initially yeah. because I was trying to get through, a, you know, informing him of the process. He didn't want to hear it. So in the beginning, it was a little bit tense until we started actually looking at the evidence that was provided to us. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part is, is when you have a client and, you know, I try to teach my students this and my former attorneys that I used to train is that, you know, when you have someone who's just adamant, even if you, I mean, if they, if they just keep persisting on, on a certain point, you need to probably open up and, and take a look. They may not be communicating with you the way that you normally would communicate, but they're saying something, there's something about the case that bothers them. And normally that's where that justice falls in. Um, how, how did you unravel this? Well, we have, uh, at the time, we had three very good investigators who worked for our office. 
and uh, an investigator got assigned. And as the uh, evidence was coming in through the U.S. Attorney's Office, we started looking at it, uh, breaking it down piece by piece, and then investigating each aspect of it. Um, the original piece that really caught us in terms of the evidence was there was a 911 photograph of the crime scene which had the pedestal of the mailbox. And then there was a description from Catherine Kahlo of what type of mailbox sat on that pedestal and the value. So all we were doing, we were, didn't even think anything was wrong with it. We were just verifying with the manufacturer what mailbox belonged on this pedestal and what was the value. We did not think for a moment that this was going to lead anywhere. And that was our first inquiry. That's what's so incredible, though. I mean, because in the state court, and I don't want to, we only have a half hour, but remember, in state court, in order for it to be a felony, it has to be, at that time, valued over $300 or more. That's right. Right? And so now in federal court, it doesn't matter, right? So what's so incredible about this is that you were still looking at that, even though it didn't really matter for the federal charge. That's right. I mean, Brian Wise, who was investigating at that point, he contacted the manufacturer. There was a specific description of the mailbox, a Gaines mailbox. And it's a remarkably expensive mailbox. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew anybody could spend that amount of money on a mailbox. And Catherine Kelo had said that she bought it used for like $380. So Brian was looking into it, and he contacted Gaines, and, and the Gaines guy said, because he had a picture of it, he said, that's not our mailbox. That's not our pedestal. But he's a mailbox guy. So he said, but I know who does make this, and he put, he put Brian in touch with or told him how to reach the guy from uh, Gibraltar, or uh, I forget the name they used in the trial. But anyway, and, and that guy was contacted, and it turned out you could buy that mailbox brand new for about $150, which means it's not a felony to steal right. it. But if it's a Gaines mailbox, over $300 value, even used, that makes it a felony. And I think that was the, one of the first things that struck us is, okay, there's something really wrong with this case. Right, because why would someone lie about the make and model of their mailbox? What's the point of that? other than to make it a felony rather than a misdemeanor. And so if you're lying right there, right off the bat, about something so simple, then there's got to be something else going on. Right. So, then you, so how did it unravel after so that? So the next piece of the puzzle that came in was what we had received was a summary report of the homicide detective's investigation. So, of course, Detective Akagi, who was assigned, is a homicide detective on a mailbox case. That's right off the bat peculiar. But then as we're looking at the <laughs> reports, we're seeing the chain of custody log for when the videotape of the surveillance log was, log, uh, was taken. Right. And, when it was, uh, and that was at 8.59 in the morning, according to the custodial log. But we know that Catherine Kailoa, according to the reports, didn't call 911 until 1.30 in the afternoon. So how is it possible that evidence is being seized from a crime scene before the crime has been, even been reported? So that was the second huge piece that didn't fit. Yeah. And at, at that point, you start really believing Gerard when he's saying, hey, I am actually innocent. Because I could still see him saying, I'm actually innocent. And then you're saying, well, maybe they, they and you believe in him, but then thinking that the KLO has just mistook him in the video. You know what I mean? So it's just a, a case of honest but mistaken identity as opposed to what we found out later is a setup. Although I don't think we were too, uh, I don't know, I was never too convinced that it was a honest but mistaken identity. Because the mistaken identity cases of which there's many, and, and the Innocence Project knows about this, are usually someone who's identifying someone they don't know. Right. If you're identifying someone you've known for 20 or 30 years, even off a of videotape, which isn't that great a quality, the likelihood that you'll make a positive identification and be mistaken seems to me kind of low. I, I agree with you totally, and that's absolutely right. You know, all the mistaken identification cases from, you know, 75% of the wrongful convictions are based on eyewitness misidentification, and you're absolutely right. It's because the people don't know their perpetrator. But here, I, I'm thinking, well, maybe because they're so angry at him. There's so much tension going back and forth between the family. They're, so, they're being sued, and it's just so much, you know, that they became angry. It's like, well, the only person that could have stole this mailbox is Gerard. And that's what I'm thinking 
still may be the honest, you know what I mean? I think it's possible, but I mean, I think that defense was presented yes. in the criminal trial last, uh, for the last four or five weeks, and I don't think the trial jury was uh, deterred too long oh, no, by no, that. No doubt about it. So after that happens, you guys still persisted. Well, there was, at that point, you know, there's a million things to do. Every piece of that police report and every report that was attached to it, we closely examined and essentially determined through multiple subpoenas uh, that every single police report that we were given was false. is either outright false or misleading or altered. Um, and a lot of the evidence we uncovered, uh, we had to do through subpoenas, subpoenas that HPD was fighting us against, subpoenas that both Catherine and Louis Kailoa fought us in uh, closed hearings for us not to get the evidence. Um, we had Gerard Puana, who amazingly enough, uh, took, started taking photographs of cars yeah. that he thought were surveying him, and we ran the license plate numbers. We had to do that by subpoenas, and you have to do it piecemeal. You've got a subpoena from the, the, the licensing department, getting whose vehicle that is, then you have to subpoena the HPD for that person when we found out it was an officer, of was the car registered or, or to them, or was it an official car, who was driving it. So there were multiple steps that we had to go through to establish that uh, Mr. Puana was under surveillance at a time that he was never even a suspect. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I imagine as this is going on, um, do, do you ever tell the court or the, the U.S. attorney at that point, we believe our client's being set up, or you just, you're gonna wait till you presented at trial? Well, Peter and I had long talks about this. Um, there, Les Osborne was the prosecutor in the case, and basically through communications with him and uh, from known practice, we didn't believe that if we simply presented all the evidence we had to the prosecutors before trial that we were going to be taken seriously. So it was only after the trial um, that, and where we had made our opening statement, we'd already caught Mr. Silva in a lie. Um, the chief had thrown the trial, as far as I was concerned, that we felt comfortable going back and saying, okay, let's sit down and show you the evidence. It was that, and, and Mr. Wolf and I had long discussions about whether we should even do that. And we finally came to the conclusion to trust the U.S. Attorney's Office and to trust Mr. Tong and Mr. Osborne and present the evidence. Yeah, that's them. a huge decision, I can imagine. Because and, and then, to their credit, once, once we did do that, they did take it seriously. Yeah. And that's what resulted in the dismissal of the case after the mistrial so that it couldn't be uh, tried again. And then that's what led to the uh, further investigation by the Department of Justice and the FBI. And I think it's worth mentioning, it's definitely worth mentioning, because the FBI and the case that was presented in the recent criminal trial which resulted in the convictions, they learned a lot more than we knew. I mean, way more, uh, because they have the ability to do it. I mean, they collected all the bank records that could be relevant, and it turned out a bunch of them were relevant. They collected all the cell phone uh, communications for the players and oh, yeah. were demonstrating to the jury how that was relevant. And they found out and investigated the... Uh, the uh, ripoff of the uh, Taito siblings uh, trust fund. And, and so, I mean, I think that we deserve credit for representing Gerard, but the case, the criminal case that was presented started, I think, with the investigation we'd done, but it, but it needs to be, the public needs to understand that a whole lot more work was done before what we had done could turn into a criminal prosecution that could be successfully pursued. And right, we're about to go to break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about the, the, the criminal trial you just spoke about, the FBI agents that were involved, along with the federal prosecutors, and what you guys thought about um, the trial. Um, you were excluded as a witness, um, but Peter, you and I sat through most of it. And um, when we get back from the break, we'll also talk about what do we think the sentencing will be based on the federal sentencing guidelines of each defendant that was convicted last week. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. 
Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Jane Sugimura, host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. All right, we're back for the last part of our show. But during the break, um, Ali, we were talking about um, your first meeting, you and Peter's first meeting with the FBI. When you go to them and you say, hey, look, guess what? We really believe that the, the uh, chief of police, because he was the chief at that time, right? And this high-ranking prosecutor that are married and a power couple in Hawaii are actually criminals. And how did that go? So <laughs> when they initially came to our office, uh, they were not happy. And in fact, they both refused to shake my hand. Um, when we got into the room to show them the evidence, they immediately made a statement that they didn't like the fact that they were there and that we were uh, kind of telling the press that they were, we were meeting with them. They made it very clear that just get on with it. Just show us the evidence and get on with it. Because we are adversarial in our day-to-day right. -day operations. So uh, it did not go well, let's say, for five minutes because I did not take too kindly to those remarks and I made remarks back to them. But after, you know, after we got over that, I broke down the mailbox for them and showed the two different mailboxes and how they had lied about it and how we believed one of the mailboxes had been rigged to come off, as you saw in the video. And within 10, 15 minutes, uh, they're on the floor with me as we had the mail mailboxes. We were taking them apart. We were putting them back together. So after about 15 minutes, all of the beginning suspicion and anger evaporated and the next two hours went very well. And, and as Peter was saying, I think the important part of their continuing investigation was to show the financial motive. Because as you stated, both of you stated before, uh, you know, why, why would they set him up to steal a mailbox? You're talking about the chief of police and the high-ranking right. prosecutor, right? And it's not until you get to all the money matters and, and the desperation that they were in at that point and the pressure that, that Grandma Puana and Gerard was putting on the KLO highs that they had to resort to this action. I think that's right. And what, what we saw in the trial and what is summarized in the indictment is just shows a remarkably comprehensive uh, investigation and a really comprehensive presentation of a complicated case to a jury that turned out to be uh, very effective because uh, four of the five defendants were convicted. And they showed motives. I mean, we knew there were problems, and we knew there was a certain extent that there was a motive because of Gerard and his mother's uh, lawsuit. But the kind of things that the FBI was able to uncover and that the prosecutors were able to present uh, in the trial was far beyond anything that uh, we had thought or knew about. And, uh, and so I think that it's important that, uh, that this case also be seen as a vindication of the system that can work uh, correctly and did in this case and, and really not just allow people of high position to uh, walk away because of their presumed uh, position or influence or authority and, and show that when you really dig into it, maybe there's some real wrongdoing, which I think was proved here. We have a picture, if you can put the photo up, of the federal prosecutors and the FBI agent who went by after the verdict uh, to tell Grandma Florence that she had finally received some justice after over uh, darn near a decade uh, of being uh, um, on the other end of it, you know, and, and just losing her house. I mean, when she took the stand and, and going to the trial, um, and some of the jurors have spoke publicly uh, since then on a couple of news stations, that it was grandma's testimony, the video testimony, that, that really, you know, uh, cinched it for him. What yeah. do you think? I mean, that was a very classy move on the part of the government to go and present the verdict forms to uh, Florence Pawana. It was very generous of them, and I think she really appreciated it. Uh, you know, the government did a great job. Mr. Wheat was on the ball. His staff was on the ball. Um, from the moment I met him, he knew things that I had never seen or was able to uncover. He was on it. Uh, he impressed me from the very first day I met him. 
which was very important because up until that point, I wasn't sure anything was going to be done. Yeah. Uh, so his, you know, his team and his prosecution unit deserve a lot of credit for the case that was put on and for these convictions. You know, you were you were in trial that day when when Florence's video was played to the, or part of the day, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and what was your impression? Well, I I remember you telling me that you thought that she was the most important witness. Maybe you told me that later on in the trial, and I think that judgment was correct. And based on what the jurors said, a few of them that spoke to the news media afterward it seemed like they thought the same thing. Uh, because the hard part about a case like this is to answer the question, why would the chief of police, his wife, who's a second or third or maybe fourth ranked deputy prosecutor, uh, a lieutenant in charge of CIA, why would these people get together and do this? What possible reason would there be to do it? And I think that uh, Florence Pawana's testimony showed why and showed that uh, people were willing to use their positions to uh, overreach on others and get them to go along with it and participate in it. Not only that, but you, you, you both know from being trial attorneys, you know, when, when you have a victim that can make a jury truly feel um, emotion, anger, and, 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 and to the point where, you know, I think Wheatnam did an excellent job of telling this jury, you are, you're the ones that can bring justice to grandma. Right? It's up to you. She hasn't got justice through, through what Katnam did from stealing her money. Uh, she got ripped off at the civil trial, right? And, and so they empowered that jury to feel something so powerful that it came back, the verdict came back so fast, I was shocked. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I yeah, was... I was surprised. I, I was surprised. Because in, you've done, we've all done a ton of conspiracy cases uh, in federal court, and even on drug conspiracies with multiple co-defendants, it takes longer than this, right? And so they, 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 they were swayed by the evidence to a point where they were just utterly convinced uh, of the guilt of those four defendants. And I think the uh, closing argument made by Joe Orobono was uh, very effective. <laughs> and I thought also that... You're uh, smashing them in that closing, man. <laughs> I was a little surprised that uh, Michael Wheat turned it over to him to do it because he had done the opening, but I think it showed uh, that you know he was paying attention to the best way to present it, and he allowed his colleague to do both parts of the closing, and I think it was quite effective. I th not only that, but what it showed me about Wheat is, you know, most trial lawyers have egos, right? And so, you know, closing right. showtime, right? And for him to say, you know what, I'm going to put this young man who's, who's a great storyteller. I mean, we, I mean, uh, what's his name, Joseph? Joseph I call him the Hulk, man. You know, Hulk <laughs> smash. That's what I, th I see Wheat just like, Hulk going in and smash. Hulk was smashing. Um, but, to, but to set aside the ego and say, you know what, I'm going to put the best, put my people in the best place possible to represent the United States of America and to bring justice for, I just thought it was amazing. Right. I mean, I think what this trial showed and what we've just been talking about is the government's serious. This is serious oh, yeah. business. Uh, I don't know how many people in Hawaii government and politics took this seriously or thought it, you know, but Mr. Wheat's very serious. He's a, he's a lifelong career prosecutor in, and he does corruption cases around the United States, and he's no joke. And he brought in a serious team. He's going to get his convictions as best he can. That's what it's about. He will not tolerate lying on the stand or lying in front of the grand jury. Uh, so I think this sends a message to the next round of cases that yeah, are coming. I hope so. I hope, I hope the attorneys for any other people getting target letters and subject letters and can you come down talk to the grand jury, uh, telephone calls, we'll let these people know that this is not a joke. This is not a joke. Uh, and we'll see, let, I want to get to the sentencing. What, what, what are your state sentencing courts, you know, I'm from Ohio, but I did in Kentucky and other. Though in the state court, the sentencing is just totally different from federal court. Right. And in yeah. federal courts, you have to sit down with the client. You got to kind of go through the guidelines. Yeah, there's guidelines for almost every uh, offense in the federal code, of which there's many. And the guidelines here, I think, come out differently for the different defendants. Right. Uh, but I think that uh, the person facing the longest sentence under the guidelines is Catherine Kaloha. And uh, I think that Louis Kaloha and Derek Hahn are probably come out about the same. And I think Bobby Nguyen, because he's in lesser position of authority, probably comes out the lowest. The guidelines are advisory, 
At one time, when they first came in, they were mandatory, but since 2006, they've been advisory. Right. So the judge has to determine the guidelines correctly, and then once he determines them correctly, he uh, has discretion to go upward or downward to vary from the guidelines depending on other factors that he thinks uh, ought to be taken into account that aren't fully taken into account by the guidelines. The way I describe it to my clients, and I know that Peter doesn't agree with me on this, is think of a circus tent, and you have that pole in the middle of the circus tent that holds up the whole tent. That's the guidelines. You start there. And then, based upon individualized circumstances for each defendant, you can go lower or higher. Yeah. Uh, that's how I explain the guidelines. Absolutely. And, and they can be complicated, but, but you can kind of at least give a client, when you go through the guidelines, a guideline range of where they will, will fall. And I had guessed uh, last week sometime that, that um, Bobby Wynn and Derek Hahn would be somewhere around three or four years, uh, Louis around five to seven, and then Catherine anywhere from five up to 12, depending on how high the judge wants to go up. Peter, what, what do you think? Yeah, I don't think it's that high. I think, uh, and I don't know that I've completely done this correctly, but I think she's looking at 70 to 87 months of imprisonment as the recommended sentence. Uh, Mr. Hahn and Louis K. Lohar looking at 47, 6 to 57 months, and uh, Bobby Nguyen at 37 to 46 months of imprisonment. But the thing that's unusual about this case, so the guidelines contain adjustment for abuse of a position of trust, public trust or private trust. But I think that when you're talking about the chief of police or high-ranking prosecutor, the two levels that you get upwardly adjusted for a position of public trust could be viewed by the court as uh, inadequate to really deal with what happened here. The chief of police is as high a position of public trust as you can have, probably, and not be an elected official. And uh, I can't think of anyone in a higher position in the city and county who's not uh, elected. And uh, so it may be that the two-level adjustment that the guidelines call for would be seen by the court as uh, not really representing uh, enough of, uh, of an adjustment. And we got a taste of Judge Seabright's view when he was talking during the detention oh, oh, yeah. hearing, uh, which was the first time that he was able to express his view, because during the trial, a judge has to be neutral. So that was the first time we heard from Judge Seabright. And I would be uh, taking a word of caution you know, from that, that these defendants may be looking at higher sentences than what the guidelines may call for. And we have to wrap it up, but I want to say this too. And that's the reason why I went a little bit higher. It's not just that they were in positions of public trust, but what did they use their positions for right. to further advance it? And then to use, because Bobby and Derek may not have known about the financial concerns that was going on with the Kealohas, right? right. And so now they're just being used by the chief who's in that position, you know, who can order them to do this stuff. To, I mean, it was just, and then all the surveillance, et cetera. Uh, we're out of time. I wish Jay Fidel would have given us an, uh, two hours to talk about this, man, because I wanted to get into my crybaby criminal stuff. Uh, don't be a crybaby criminal, Chief. But anyway, uh, Peter, uh, Ali, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See y'all later. We're out.